Let's pray. Holy God, we seek your wisdom and truth in Scripture. Send your Holy Spirit upon us to open our minds and our hearts to receive the gift of your word. Challenge and comfort us with what we hear and grant us strength to follow Jesus, your living word. Amen. There's a relatively famous pastor named John Piper that I occasionally agree with, um, not too often, but I do respect him. He's been an influential leader in the Reformed Christian movement for about 30 or 40 years now. And I read that as his church grew, his influence obviously increased, and the fees he could command for a single day of talking to your church was kind of outrageous. But despite that, he started to get a little bit famous because he's a funny guy. He planted the church that he pastored in Minnesota, and he bought a very little bungalow, and he just kept living in that bungalow the entire time he ministered. He bought a beater car, and he used the same car and then bought other old used cars that were particularly unimpressive year after year. He decided early on that he would be happy to live with as little as possible and that he would refuse to worry about how much money other ministers were making. And this remained true as they became something of a megachurch. He figured he had something that other ministers wouldn't. He had enough. And so as this church grew, at one point, they were over 5,000 people on Sundays. And he started to notice there was a problem in his staff. They kept leaving. And I don't know if you know this, but in a lot of mega churches, there's a lot of yelling and screaming behind closed doors, and staff overturn is generally a sign of really bad behavior. And so John was concerned, why are people leaving? So he looked into it, and he was told, well, since there's a hard cap on salaries here, we lose people. They come, they get experience, and then they get poached because their salaries are are lower than even the lowest level mega church jobs, and so they get their experience, and away they go. Now, John gets confused because he's been there since the beginning of the church. He's moderated the session since its inception, and he doesn't remember ever having anything like a hard cap put on salaries at the church. Furthermore, he's a best-selling author who's donating all of his proceeds back to the church because he writes the books on church time in his office, and so he knows full well there's literally millions of dollars happening in this congregation. So he asks, Where, when did I miss this hard cap? What happened here? And they explained to him that since he had capped his salary, again, at a number lower than the low-level megachurch employee, they assumed that nobody on staff could make more than the lead. And so everybody had to make less. And he told them that's really not what he had in mind, that he was actually just legitimately happy with his old car and his bungalow and would rather if they paid people enough to stay a while and build relationships. And so that's what they started doing. And I think you need that context to understand a sermon he gave in the year 2000. He was launching what became a very important theme for the second half of his ministry. It was called Don't Waste Your Life. In that sermon, he describes how there's these two women in the newspaper. They're both well into their 80s. They were missionaries in Cameroon, and they were murdered. And the newspaper was all about how much of a tragedy this was. And John tried to argue that, in fact, it would be kind of a good thing to be in your 80s and still have passion and interest and motivation and be fighting for the kingdom and, and, and being excited about life. And then he contrasted those ladies with another article in the same newspaper. It was about a couple. He was 59 and she was 51, and they had managed to retire early. And the article was talking about how great these people are, how wonderful their life is. They spend all of their time playing softball, floating on their 36-foot boat, and collecting seashells. And John says, I think that's the tragic life. Imagine you have one life to live, and you spend it floating around, bobbing up and down, and collecting seashells. And then he very passionately says, if you go stand before the Lord Almighty at the end of your days, and you say, 
what did I do with my time? And the best you have is a bag of shells. In that exact moment, you will realize the foolishness of what you've done. Now, I think that foolishness is popular. It's a certain view of money, a certain view of life. And I want to talk a little bit about it, partly because churches don't talk about money very much. Churches avoid making a big deal about the offering as though it's something shameful, when in fact it's something joyfully given so that work can be done in the neighborhood and in the world in Christ's name. Other churches will only speak of money when there's a desperate need, like the roof needs doing or the boiler needs fixing or whatever, and then we'll have a couple of sermons on money. But Jesus spoke about money really often. And he didn't ask for money. That's what I notice when I look at all these passages of Jesus talking about money. Like in this passage, he doesn't ask the rich young man to give him his money. He just says, give it away. There's no implication that Jesus and his disciples are going to get the money. What he's doing over and over again is trying to get people to reflect on the role of money in their well-being. So when John Piper stands up in front of a crowd of 40,000 young people, four with four zeros after it, standing room only in a stadium, he is not asking them for money. He doesn't need their money. He's pleading with them to not make the mistake of the early retirees, but to set out in life with goals, goals like serving Jesus, goals like making the world better, goals like trying to serve rather than be served, to comfort rather than to be comforted, to be using their one precious life for a better world. And John, like I said, he could have had millions, but he saw that as a shell game. He saw it as a threat to his soul because he read the Bible and he saw Jesus talking about this over and over again. And so he walked away from that life and he walked towards deeper meaning and purpose and sought to help other people. Now, some people laugh at these stories. I don't know if you remember this. Do you know Jim Carrey? He's a fairly famous Canadian guy. Uh, he, yeah, he made a speech at one point and it's gone down in history as one of the most white privileged speeches of all time. But in the speech, he says, I wish everybody could have their 15 minutes and their millions of dollars because then they would see it's not the answer. Because people who experience it know it's not the answer. Of course, the rest of us want to laugh and say, we'll gladly take our 15 minutes and millions. Now, all that kind of leads you to the story of Jesus with the wealthy young man. He's not happy despite, quote, having it all. If you read the story, this guy's rich. He's young. He has basically no troubles in life. He appears to get along with his family, his friends, be respected in his community, doing the right thing. And like many people who today do everything they were supposed to, they get a degree, they get married, they get a house, maybe a car. Maybe they get married again. Maybe they have kids. And then it's not so satisfying after a little while. So then they got to collect other things. Some people start collecting degrees, certificates, books, paintings, stamps. So they do really well, cars. Maybe they start to travel a lot, go to big concerts, big sporting events. Maybe they buy a cottage. And none of it accomplishes what they're hoping it will. That's why they have to keep buying more stuff. They're all like the young man who goes to see Jesus and needs something more. Jesus counsels him, retain your relationships, retain your responsibilities. When he says, give away your wealth, he's not saying be unaccountable and don't take care of people. But he is saying, give away your wealth to the extent that you can and still retain relationship. Now, the reaction is one of my favorite in all of literature, not just the Bible, but books in general, it's so counterintuitive and countercultural and yet so obviously true and oxymoronic at the same time. I love it. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. How many people in the history of the planet have been sorrowful for having great possessions? I'm going to go ahead and guess not many. 
most people collect things and it proves we're doing well in life or they're supposed to give us joy somehow. We might get a sense of what Jesus is getting at when we think of people that promote things like decluttering or Marie Kondo and sparking joy. But for the most part, we all like our fancy stuff. I've been in people's houses. You got nice stuff. I like my nice stuff. I have a bike that is more expensive than most people will spend on all the bikes they ever have in their entire life combined. Don't cost as much as my bike. <laughs> when I put my bike on my van, while well, with Mary's bike, it is worth substantially more than my van. <laughs> Some of us have nice stuff and we like it. But maybe, just maybe, the popularity of minimalism and decluttering gets at a hint of the discomfort we have with our relationship to money right now. I think a lot of us sense something is wrong and we don't know exactly what. And like the man in the story, we can be told what. And we still can't do it. There's a great analogy of this that came out this week, thanks to a variety of places. Have you seen this, the new rules for drinking in Canada? The new suggestions? I've heard so many jokes about this in the last week. But you understand what it's saying? They're saying alcohol is a class one carcinogen. It's the same as asbestos and tobacco. And I know most of us wouldn't drink or touch or smoke any of those. And yet we will happily go over our two glasses a week, won't we? Jesus is interested in money. John Piper was careful about his money and his teaching because money is a spiritual issue pretending to be purely material. I've been reading this book, and it's about how it can be hard to be Christian because the church has done a lot of bad stuff over time, and like a lot of it's embarrassing, uh, especially recently, like it's a brand new book. Uh, and, and then he talks a whole chapter on our discomfort around our relationship to Judaism. And I'm going to read you this chunk because it, it, you'll see we're going somewhere. He says, the Jews became... The other choice upon whom European Christians repeatedly projected their pent-up anxiety and violence. Over 200 pogroms, organized massacres, erupted during that plague outbreak alone with an especially horrific massacre occurring in Strasbourg, France on Valentine's Day 1349. The citizens of Strasbourg rounded up the community of 2,000 Jews, brought them to the Jewish cemetery, and said it was their religion that was leading them to poison the wells where Christians drank. And that was the source of the bubonic plague. They had either to renounce their religion or be killed on the spot. Half the Jews held to their religion, and they were burned alive. Now, this sort of thing you already know is part of our history, right? I think most of us are aware that we're not proud of it, but it's true. And why I'm sharing it, though, is that within a generation, a priest slash historian. So this is like within 25 years of this happening, the church itself looking back on its own past. And he recounts the motives and he includes money as well as the plague-inspired panic. After the slaughter, everything that was owed to the Jews was conveniently canceled. The council took the cash that the Jews possessed and divided it among the working men proportionately. And this is the real killer quote. Again, this is the priest historian talking about something that happened 20 years before. The money was indeed the thing that killed the Jews. If they had been poor and if the feudal lords had not been in debt to them, they would not have burnt them. Later that year, Pope Charles IV officially pardoned the city for its crimes of mass murder and theft. Some might call upon that pardon an act of mercy, but it has the scent of cover up and complicity. This is the church talking about itself. Do you see that the people are so in love with the money that they can't even see how it's driving them to the massacre? It makes them susceptible to stories that are illogical, 
the wells that are supposedly being poisoned by Jews that are supposedly only killing Christians when obviously the plague is equally killing the Jews in the town. And it leads them to murder. Money is working at the root of their souls. I bet their churches weren't talking enough about money. And we might want to distance ourselves because they're like 1350 and we're 2023, so we're kind of fancy. But I don't think we're as different from them as we think we are. I think if you scratch our consumerism, you're going to get uncomfortable real quick. And that's what Jesus tried to do. We willingly try not to see things or we shrug them off with great intention and care. If you are like me, some of you probably are, your day begins literally every single day with coffee or tea for some of you, the wrong part. When you have your cup of coffee or tea, who grows the coffee and the tea? Who picks it? Who roasts it? What conditions are they working in? Are children involved in the growing and picking of your coffee and tea? Is the planet well tended? Or is it depleted by the agricultural practice that gets your coffee to your table every day? What do you have to ignore in the name of saving a few dollars on coffee? If you're like me, it is very rare that a day goes by that you don't eat. Who grows the food? Who picks the food? How is the land treated? How far does the food have to travel and what are the impacts of the travel? What do we have to ignore to have cheaper food? Then perhaps the ugliest of them all, if you are like me, and I can see that you are, you tend to wear clothes most of the time. Cotton has to be grown somewhere by someone, has to be picked somewhere by someone. If it has colors, those have to be added somewhere by someone. Who makes the clothes you wear and under what conditions? You can see the question, what are you ignoring to save a couple bucks on clothes that you even don't need? At least the food we need to eat it. We all have too much clothes. When you get into the clothes stuff, there's horrifying stories about working conditions, places that look an awful lot like slavery, places where workers in factories are literally branded, places where women are raped daily so that they can keep their jobs. The environmental issues around these places are incredible. We know that we would never tolerate them here, but they're not here. They're over there. And so we can ignore it and have cheaper clothes. When you choose a store to shop in, what store do you go to? Many employers now have ads in the staff rooms for food banks, food stamp programs, because they know they're paying their employees too little to get by. When we order online, there are certain companies, I'm not bothering to name them, but if you take 10 seconds, you'll find them where the number of injuries in the warehouses is so high that the ambulances are sitting in their parking lots because ambulances sit all day where they're closest to the most likely calls. And so there are some warehouses that you'll know of where there's an ambulance all day, every day. What stories do we ignore to save a few bucks? What's the impact of the climate change directly related to all of this, to cheap fossil fuels, to the animal products we desire? You know the stories? Pakistan flooded. Like how many millions of people die in floods, fires, famines, crop failures, resulting from our lifestyle, all of us. I'm, I'm part of it. What Jesus is getting at is you have to willfully, intentionally ignore all of that if you're going to maintain the status quo. 
What I would ask is who's poisoning whose well? Because it feels like we are. Jesus knew full well when we take money to be too high a priority, people are literally going to die and our souls are going to shrivel. Now, I'm mentioning big issues, right? Individuals can only do so much, and I get that. And I'm not only trying to make us feel guilty, but I am trying to make us feel uncomfortable and at least a little bit guilty. I don't know about you. I'm not comfortable with the idea that six-year-olds might be picking my coffee and not going to school. I think that's outrageous. I want us to think about how we relate to money and what it might actually be doing to our souls. I'm totally convinced we are an awful lot closer to those pogrom thirsty people from 700 years ago than we want to admit. I'm not asking you for money. I'm asking you to consider its place in your life. And I know it's complicated. We all need money. We all need to eat. We all need to wear clothes. And I want my bike. But how's your approach to money working for you, really? Do you worry about money? Like with all those savings, are we still worried about money? It's this great, brilliant guy, Bill McKibben. He, he wrote a book in the 80s about this. And he said the problem with climate change, as far as he was concerned, is that we weren't having fun. He said, it's one thing to tear the house down if you have a rip-roaring party and everybody has a great time. But when we're not having a good time, how dare we ruin it? And I wonder about that. How much are we enjoying what we've got? When you approach money, do you find ways to be generous and open-handed? Are you looking beyond the sticker price to figure out how much something costs? There's this guy, Brian McLaren. He, he wrote a book. Uh, he's a pastor. And he says, I have not only been on the receiving end of Christian fundraising. My wife and I have made giving a priority in our family budget for our whole married lives, following the generous example of my parents and grandparents who lived frugally so that they could give generously. To put it bluntly, and again, I'm not asking you for money, listen to this. I believe in giving and find great joy in it, but I also believe every religious system, like every individual, faces the perpetual danger of being corrupted by money. I'm really not standing here saying give more to the church. Although if you do, fine. But where does it fit in your life? You ever stay awake at night worrying about money when you know you're not going to run out? I knew a church that had tens of millions of dollars in the bank and its leadership every single time they met talked about nothing but how they were running out of money. We live in grace. We are forgiven people. The blood of Christ hanging on a cross. We are free. We have eternal life. We don't earn it. The young ruler cannot earn it. Giving the money away doesn't earn it. But Jesus at the same time wants to take us under his wing. He wants to breathe abundant life and flourishing into us. He sees money as incredibly dangerous to us. And so we better pay attention to it. He often sought to comfort his people when they were hurting despairing, lacking hope, whatever. And he often tried to challenge them and make them uncomfortable and angry. They walk away from him. He preaches to thousands and everybody leaves. He doesn't just say what they want to hear. He tells them what they need to hear, what he thought was good for them. And he often taught in parables and he let the people sort out what it meant. Often my job in theory is to kind of help you figure out what they mean. But Jesus... He uses the stories and they're vague on purpose. Many of us are uncomfortable with our money and our practices. Many will feel defensive when I point out to you that your cheap coffee is causing slavery around the world, or that your burger is literally flooding somebody's field and they need that field to get through the year. We're definitely more comfortable than we should be. Jesus wants to problematize our relationship to money. And I'm going to end the sermon with a really old prayer because this is an old problem. And here's a challenge for you this week, and it's not to give more money away. When you spend money this week, cash, credit, whatever, pause 
think about exactly what you are supporting, what system you're buying into literally when you spend your money this week. And maybe, I know you won't remember all of it. I'm going to say it, and then we're going to sing it, so you might remember part of it. Think of this prayer from St. Francis. Let's pray it. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.